Hey, this is Elijah Trice, and you are listening to The Truth in This Art with Rob Lee. Welcome to The Truth in This Art. I am your host, Rob Lee. And today, my guest is a social entrepreneur, a uh, storyteller, artist, social justice advocate, and the author of The Master Plan, My Journey from a Life in Prison to a Life of Purpose. Please welcome Chris Wilson. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining the podcast. And um, yeah, I think this is uh, one long-awaited conversation and a, a conversation I've been looking forward to. I got a, l- got a little nerves on it, but uh, we're good. <laughs> we're good. So... You know, before we get too deep into the conversation, um, and I, I want to open it up to kind of that that general question, almost in a elevator pitch sort sort of way. What is the Chris Wilson story, and um, you know, what was that first experience um, with art? Because that's what I knew you from initially. Yes, yes, sure. So uh, I, my story essentially, I'm originally I'm born and raised in Washington D.C. And I grew up in the late 80s, early 90s era, the, the old D.C., the real D.C. Like D.C. <laughs> has changed uh, since then. And so I grew up uh, uh, spending my weekends with my mom, but my grandparents raised me Monday through Friday uh, in Washington, D.C. And I spent my weekends with my mom. And my mom at the time was in a very abusive relationship with a, a police officer, a, a crooked cop, kind of like uh, Denzel Washington in Training Day, uh, just a real smooth, charismatic uh, person, but just was, you know, just wasn't a good person. Yeah. And so he would verbally and physically abuse us. And uh, one day he attacked us, me and my mom, and tried to kill us, uh, sexually assaulted my mom in front of me. Well, we survived, but he he was uh, arrested. He lost his job and he came home and he started stalking us. And back then there was no law against stalking. So this was like Cape Fear with like Robert De Niro. And yeah. he's just like, you know, he, he broke in the house one time and fell through the ceiling. We would call the police. And because he used to be a police officer, he got all these like special, you know, get out of jail free passes that he would like implement. Um, but fast forward, he ended up being responsible for uh, the loss of my cousin, which when he was gunned down in front of the house, they shot my brother. And I started carrying a firearm back then. Yeah. And for protection. And then uh, not too long after this, some men came after me and I ended up taking a person's life and I was found guilty, charged as an adult at 17 and sentenced to natural life in prison. And that's kind of what, I, you know, my time in prison was like the transformation of when I made a decision to turn my life around, which my book is about. Thank you. Wow. It, it, we, we get we got really got really into the real stories like oh yeah yeah and i mean i'm i'm glad that you're you're here you know it's it's, it's one of those things yeah me too i, I mean actually uh so, so i'm on instagram a lot and, and social media but I, and i live every day as you know like it's a, a vacation because i really appreciate life because i spent almost half of my life uh in prison just yeah. dreaming about the life that I live now. And so I try to enjoy every second of it. And that's, and that's why you're like a firefighter, as you were saying, yeah. before we got yeah. started, it's like, I'm going to the next thing. Like, where are we at? Yeah. <laughs> so let's, let's start, let's, let's uh, talk about um, art a little bit. Um, yes. So as an artist, like, when did you know who you were? And I, and I know that that's kind of one of those, those questions that seems like it's a little vague, but when did you know who you were as an artist? And tell me about like, you know, your work uh, that you were doing before you made that discovery. Yeah, absolutely. It's strange because I, I think back to college, you know, uh, art history was a prerequisite that, mm-hmm. that we had, we had to take in order to uh, uh, graduate college. And I complained about this big, thick art book that I had to read. And I was like, this is so boring. I have no interest in it. I don't understand it. Uh, but oh, fast forward some years uh, when I, I was out of prison and I started designing furniture and doing contracting work. And I was uh, surrounded by a lot of artists and I was transporting art for, for, for people from like Baltimore to New York. Uh, Jeffrey Kent was one, uh, Paul Rucker, Jarrell Gibbs. I mean, many artists that I would, do work for. And then when I would get off work, I would go to their studios while they paint and they would tell me about what the work was about. And, and that's, that's what kind of intrigued me for a long time about, you know, about race in America, about black culture, about, you know, uh, all kinds of things, oppression. And 
you know, maybe a year after that of, of doing that, uh, Jeffrey Kent for my birthday gifted me some art lessons. And he was like, is something in you? I was like, why can't you give me some money for my birthday? <laughs> no. He says, you have something in you and I want to give you some lessons. And I took, he said five lessons. I took two and I fell in love with art. And I just, I've been painting every day ever since. Wow. It, it, it takes that, it takes that person that's kind of like, they see it and they're like, nah, uh, I, I could give you this, but it, it's like this joke that I like where if someone was given a bunch of money, like who's going to start a business and who's going to buy a bunch of sneakers? And it's yes. like, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. But I think when you have, when you're in one of those kind of like earlier stages and you're like, I'm doing this and they, they, there's a person that's like around that that's in that kind of capacity of being a a, a big brother, a, a relative or someone in that sort of like role. And they're like, no, I'm going to give you this. I, I, I see this in you already. And I look in my closet. I have this book, um, the, these this this bag, actually, that has several books in it um, from my like my grandmother, my, my my uncle and all of that stuff. And it's all like art books. Yeah. You know, going back to like 1990. It's like, yeah, you know, you're five, but you're going to be a next great artist or what have you. And, you know, it was kind of that that sort of like motivation. We couldn't afford like lessons or something, but it was that kind of nudge, like go after it and, you know, putting you in a position or giving you the just the umph to go for it. Yeah, totally. I mean, that that was the relationship uh, with Jeffrey and still is the relationship with him. Yeah. Shout out to Jeffrey. Um, Yeah. So I, I read um, recently that it's important. I, I knew it, but I like reread it. It's important to diversify how we work. So, I, I, so you, your medium is mostly in like what space? Like, are you, are you in digital? Are you in analog? And so on. So, if we're doing digital work, we should kind of implement analog work. And if we're doing mostly analog work, we should try to work in digital to kind of break out of these habits. How do you manage like how much digital stuff that's within your process? Because I see that you're a painting. So that's more of an analog kind of process. That's a good question. So I, I, I kind of, my preference is not to put myself in a box, but, but it, it's mostly, mostly painting. I paint mm-hmm. every day. I do drawings, but I'm also involved in film. I've been uh, producing uh, short films for a couple of years now. My, my latest film, The Box, is about solitary confinement. We just we won seven film festivals and I just sold it to New York Times. Uh, so I'm excited for people to see that. Uh, but, you know, I work in fabrics, uh, yeah. anything. I think I just have like this creative urge to, to express myself through, through art. And, you know, I started originally by doing sculptural work and, and went to Italy to study. Uh, but just the painting, just like that's my vibe right now. And I'm going through my abstract phase and mm. I, I want to tell stories uh, using colors. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have a question about colors for you yeah. then. Because because uh, whenever someone's like, yeah, you know, colors really interest me right now. I was like, all right, what, 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 what color? If colors were a mood, what's your, what's your mood right now? What, what mood are you in right now? <laughs> yeah, totally. Oh, yeah. Let's let's dive into it when you want. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Cool. So I, I want to go I want to go back into like art questions and things of that nature. But I think one of the things that's important, especially like now, I think we all got this awakening, right, of, you know, you got to be, you got to do things that are regenerative. You got to do things that serve you, that refill your cup. So what yeah. sort of practices do you have when you're out there? You're, you're everywhere, you know, what sort of practices do you have in mind that are regenerative for you? Because people are taking, people are yeah. needing time from you, needing pieces of you. So how do you regenerate yourself? I, I think, I mean, I like this question. I, I think my role as an artist is I, I, I witness history and I just document what I see and what I feel. And every piece of art that I create is about something. So uh, there's, there's something that I'm trying to say, or there's something that I've seen that I am a story that I'm trying to convey to everyone else that, I, that I've witnessed. And so a lot of travel, uh, a lot of listening. I spent some time recently in the Middle East and I'm going back uh, in October, but just a lot of time listening and, you know, I was in, you know, the Palestinian uh, refugee camps and in Gaza and in, in Tel Aviv and at the Dead Sea and just thinking about history and religion and and, and what those things mean to me. But also uh, there was also like two terrorist attacks when I was over there. And it's like, how do I how do I tell a story about my experience or what I've witnessed uh, and, and put that you know on a canvas or put that on film? And so a, a, a large chunk of my time is reading, 
going online. And it's one of the things that Jeffrey taught me. It's like any body of work that you make, you have to be able to defend it. So if I'm making Mm -hmm. a a piece of work about solitary confinement in America, I need to go online. I need to read books and and figure out what is the, what is the the pulse of solitary confinement in this country? And and what does the United Nations say? And have, how many people have I talked to who've been in solitary confinement? So this is responsibility to do my homework so that I can defend my work. And so I spend a lot of time uh, exploring, researching and, and, and learning and so the, so that I can tell the accurate story uh, through my medium. Yeah. And yeah. I love it. It doesn't even really feel like work to me, but it's just, it, it's a responsibility that I have to do. Yeah. It's, it's, it's one of those questions I have of like, how do you make work feel like play and vice versa? Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, that's, that's important. Like, you know, when you're able to go out, and kind of learn something from it that fills you up as an individual. You're like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm getting this and I'm able to incorporate this in my work, these experiences, whether they're ideal or, or unideal, but you're getting those experiences that are baked into what you're, what you're ultimately putting out. Right. I totally, I agree a hundred percent. So now in, in your work and you're, you're a multiple media author, you know, you're doing film painting, all, all of the things you're like, yeah, I got this new, uh, whatever, whatever the new wave is. Right. So, so I, I think sometimes our work is looked at through the constraints that we put in there. So what short sorts of constraints do you put in your work? For instance, um, some people may only paint with a certain color. Some people may only use certain words and omit other words, or I'm only going to use part of this story, or I'm only going to shoot with this sort of camera. What sort of constraints do you put in your work? And if if, if you are putting constraints in there, why do you put them in? That's a, I've never been asked this question before, and I'm, I'm going to do my best to, to answer this. So, so that, but there are there are some constraints. So, for me, I don't. I don't uh, paint images of dead black people. I think it's inappropriate. So I, so I don't do that. I can, I can tell their story, but it's just something about it that I just feel like it's inappropriate. Someone, someone passes away like uh, a George Floyd, for example, in, in 2020, I wouldn't paint his face uh, and, and make a body of work about that. And that's like a constraint. I just don't feel like, and, and I wouldn't want to, I sell my paintings all around the world. I wouldn't want to make money off off the images of dead black people. That's just something I, I won't do that. Right. Um, but but there's ways I can tell stories about them. But that's that's a constraint that I I just I, I won't do that. Um, I, I don't do commissions, so I don't I don't allow anyone to tell me what I should paint. You know, you either like it, you don't like it. I, I make the work. You 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 know you can accept it or, or, or not accept it. Uh, but but other than that, I think it's 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 a, a lot of freedom. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm new to the game. I've been painting for about uh, eight and a half years. Like, all of my artist friends, I said this yesterday to uh, one of my artist friends. All of my artist friends are technically uh, better than me uh, in, in in their painting skills. Sure. But that's that's not what defines a successful artist. It's not really about the technical skills. The world is filled with technically uh, proficient artists. Yeah. So I bring a little more to the table as an artist. Uh, which is why I believe I've been able to be successful. That's that's a legit. I, I remember ha- having a conversation um, with a curator here in Baltimore, um, Thomas James, and we, we were talking yeah. about like, you know, people having technical skills or like, what what, what am I feeling from the work yes. or what have you? Absolutely. And you know, that's that's a thing that I think is big. And sometimes it's a cultural thing. Sometimes it's an experience thing. It's like, oh, yeah, I got great line strokes and my use of color is amazing, but it doesn't say anything. It, it, it right. feels flat. <laughs> right. Exactly. So you, you mentioned other artists that you're around. So I got to ask you this one. And th- this one, you, you know, might be a little a little weird artist smoke. Who knows? But what what types of artists do you find to be like the best hangs? Like who who are the artists like, all right, I like to hang out with photographers or I like to hang out with painters. And if whatever they might be, why are they really cool to hang out with? I like this question. <laughs> I, you know, so Jeffrey Kent is an obvious one, but I'm going to mention a few more. So, and I'll, and I'll elaborate why. So Jeffrey Kent, uh, Jarrell Gibbs, uh, Amy Sherrill, uh, uh, Monica, who, who's, um, I'm going to mess up her last name. She, she'll, she'll beat me up if I, if I mess it up. But Monica's a really, really awesome old painter. Uh, 
Will Watson. And uh, the reason, like, I like artists, so I paint off of house music, so I like to listen to music and get my vibe going. Nice. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm not working unless the house music is bumping. And so that, and just the 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 artist life, I like to go out and eat with my artist friends. We talk about the the industry, all aspects of it, the business, the curators, like the shows, and I just think it's a, a beautiful a beautiful uh, life uh, to live. Yeah. But really, really, it's the music and the vibes and. You know, uh, all my artist friends are, are, are cool, so they're just nice to be around, and we vibe, and we travel around the world together, and I just think it's amazing. That's the thing that I always say about uh, my fellow Baltimorean artists is that we have some really dope uh, artists, some of, some of the best in the world. Yeah. So yeah. is it Monica Kegwu? Yes. Yeah. I so, was going to mess up her last name, but yeah, that's my soul sister. Yeah. So. I've interviewed all of them with the exception of Amy. <laughs> Come okay. on, Amy, let's let's make it happen. What's going yeah. on? <laughs> name you on here, yeah. Yeah, uh, Monica's great. Um, hint, hint, I might be showing up in a thing sooner or later. You know, okay. we'll, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> um, so let, let's talk about um social entrepreneurship a little bit, and 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 why was that a? How, well, how do you define social entrepreneurship, and why did it resonate with you? Sure. When I was in prison and back when I was about 19, I was two years into my to my life sentence. I've always been an entrepreneur my entire life, selling candy, cutting grass, paper routes, anything that you can think of. I was hustling and doing it my entire life. And when I got in prison, I started to. I started to understand uh, the system that was set up against us, like black folks specifically. And I always knew that I was an entrepreneur and I knew that that's what I wanted to be. So I started to think about who would I be like years from now, age 40? I I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I also thought back to what my grandfather used to tell me about, about the struggle of growing up in Mississippi and and racism. And so I knew that I wanted to help people. And so I didn't know what the term social entrepreneurship meant till many years later, but I wrote on my master plan, I want to start a business uh, that helps people. I want to build this business empire, but I want to have, create jobs for people. And I was thinking back to conversations like my uncles and my school counselors would tell us, you can do anything you want in life. You can, you can get a job, you can start your own business, and then they would leave. And I said, well, I don't even know the first thing about starting a business or, or even getting a job or writing a resume. And so when I wrote up my plan, I said, I want to be the person that, that doesn't leave the community, that will go in on a Sunday and sit down with, with people and, and walk them step through step of how to build something, how to do something, or be that inspiration for folks. And so that was that was the feeling at, at age 19. And so I was released from prison at age 32. Mm-hmm. And so I went back to college, I went to business school, and I discovered the terminology of social entrepreneurship. And it's, you know, it's triple bottom line. You know, you make profit, you can improve your environment, and you can help people. And so I just started operating from that principle. If it wasn't a, a, a gig, like when I had my construction company, if it wasn't all my men and women working on the site and being paid, I was walking away. Yeah. And so everything that I do in life, even with my art sales, like I, I take majority of my proceeds and I put it towards some good. And so I define myself as a social entrepreneur. I love to hear that. And yeah, yeah, it's it's one of those terms that people are using. People use impact and all of that. And when sometimes the proof isn't in the pudding, but the way Absolutely. that you're describing it, you broke it down in a real sense of this is tangible. This is real. This is how I want to do it. And I think a lot of times when people describe it, they're very nebulous. And you were not. You were very to the point. So much appreciated. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I got two more real questions, but I, I definitely want to key in on, you know, the master plan. Let's talk about the master plan. What was the process of, of bringing everything together? Like, you know, and what's the, how, how has it been received? Because, you know, I've, I've been on the site, I've seen like hmm, noted luminaries saying great things and, and great terms about the, um, about the book or what have you. So, so tell me about it, like from, from your vantage point as, as the writer, as the person that these are your experiences and these are your ideas, um, what was the process and how has it been received? Sure. So I I've been journaling since I was 10 years old. And when I went away, I journaled every day. I still journal every day. And so I wrote down at the age of 19 that I wanted to publish a book that inspired people. Hmm. And it was tricky for me because at the time, time that I wrote it down and said that I wanted to write this book, I hadn't done anything really positive in my life. I I essentially messed up my whole life up until like that age. But it also gave me some motivation to 
do some good in the world, do some good to myself and understand myself. And so I, I, I wrote up this plan and sent a copy to my grandmother and to my judge. And so th- they became my accountability partners. Yeah. And so I started setting goals for myself. I wanted to get a high school diploma, a college degree. I wanted to embrace therapy and learn my, and learn about myself and study business. And so I started doing all these things. And fast forward to maybe 2013, I've been home for about a year and some change. And I had started, I had two companies at this time. I was in business school. I had won a bunch of awards, including a presidential award from Obama. I I was doing the work. And I was at a point in my life where I was doing what I planned to do. And so I felt I was ready or worthy to be able to tell my story at that point. And so I worked really hard uh, to get a book deal. And it, it required me for a couple of months just jumping on the boat bus in Baltimore and going up to New York and just just for meetings and calls and just trying to trying to uh, negotiate a deal. And it took me two and a half months and I was able to get a book deal um, and publish my story. And it's been wildly successful. And it, you know, I've sold the book in other countries. I've, I've traveled all over the country, all over the world, actually. And it changed my life. And I'm happy to say that the book has changed other people's lives because I've turned the book into a course yeah. that's now in over a hundred prisons uh, we started at Rikers Island and uh, people are taking a course and graduating from it. And I get messages every single day of people like, I'm the next Chris Wilson. I'm going to do it better than you. Watch what I do. And I'm just like, OK, I'm reading more books than you. I was like, I don't think you are, but OK, like, I like it. <laughs> that's that's beautiful, man. I love hearing that. Oh, wow, that's that's great. I, I mean, I'm just I'm sitting here like, man, I'm inspired. I'm in awe. Like, shout out to you, man. Thank you. Thank you. So I got so this is the last one I got for you, and this this may be one of the deeper ones, but we'll see. Um, and I think the nature of the question is kind of that in itself. Um, so sometimes there's we we see the peak of something, and there's a much larger body under it. So it, it's almost like a warning uh, or indication for us to dig deeper. So right. when do you know that you've gone deep enough on a topic, whether you're exploring it through painting, whether you're exploring it in film or in writing? When do you know that you have hit bedrock or when do you know that you're going to dig deeper? Wow. That is a deep question. I think speak, speaking of art and, and painting, I oftentimes describe it as a weapon. This mm-hmm. the, My choice of weapons are like the paintbrushes or, or the pastel pencils, oil sticks. And I think I'm, I think I'm deep enough. Usually when I make work, uh, I have some type of purpose of it. I made a few big paintings recently uh, about solitary confinement after reading about a thousand letters from people who are currently or were formerly in solitary confinement. And I made a decision of, OK, I'm going to make this big painting. I think it's thirty thousand dollar painting and percentage of the proceeds. I'm going to donate to uh, Solitary Watch and another organization who uh, advocate against solitary confinement. And I just having that thought. In my mind, I put my house music on and I just worked. I worked and I paint and I dug deep and I and I thought about, you know, what the United Nations said about solitary confinement is torture and, you know, amplifying the voices of people who are, are advocating against this practice. I think in a situation like that, I feel like it is is deep enough. Yeah. Uh, but I, but I also I also it's almost like a Trojan horse kind of thing. Like I also make like recently been making abstract style, colorful, uh, pastel style paintings that are about really serious issues. I want you to look at it and say, this is really beautiful, but what is it about? And it's like, oh, that's actually really deep. And if I can do that, uh, I think it. I think I, I achieved my uh, my mission, my objective, if I can do that. And so I, I try to do that. that. And that's usually the purpose of everything I do. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. for You, you, you got into it. You, you didn't yeah. <laughs> you didn't let the iceberg, you know, get you off track. Yeah. All right. So that's that's kind of the, the end of the real questions. And, and thank you for indulging me in that, that side of it. Now it's going to get weird. Now it's going to get weird. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start off with a softball for you. OK. Um, name a house music song. Ooh. <laughs> it might not be a softball. You're like so many. <laughs> So what was I just playing? I was so uh I went to the store to get some coffee. Sheba Sheba San is a uh, a DJ that I, I really like. I do a lot of SoundCloud and uh Spotify uh mixes, but I think that's that's what I was playing uh today. I actually I actually really love uh 
Baltimore house uh, music too. Yeah. And I, and every chance I get, I go out and I dance uh, in Baltimore. I used to go to the Crown uh, <laughs> often, Saturday, Sunday nights, uh, 12.30 a.m. I would go and I would dance till 2 a.m. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, I can't really think of any songs. I have a lot of mixes, uh, yeah. but all of our artist friends, we all share house music every day, like in the group checks, like check mm-hmm. this out. And yeah, so I love it. I remember it was this time I was going to Chicago and they have their own, you know, oh, yeah. house. and I was like, all right, Frankie Knuckles, let's go. And yes. just, just in it. And um, I was like, if I'm going into this the first time going there, I was like, if I'm going into the city, I was like, I got to play like their soundtrack, hit it in, you know? For sure. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Chicago got it, got it. But like they get it in. Um, so you mentioned a second ago, but you're, you're, you're a coffee guy. That's, that's, that's yeah. great. How do yeah. you take your coffee? Uh, just uh, cream and sugar. Okay. Cream and sugar. I'm not a big coffee drinker, but I do drink it like every morning. I kind of start off. I'm an early bird. I get up around four or five mm-hmm. and I, I think I'll have my cup around uh, eight 30. Mm. And then I usually start my day because I work out and cycle and do stuff like that in the morning. But I usually start my days around 10 a.m. Gotcha. I, I, I envy that. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm up relatively early. I'm not up at four. I'm up at like maybe six something. And I joke with people. And I was like, hmm, you're wild, man. Like, Because <laughs> I, I would say, I'll, t- I'll have a shot, of, a shot of whiskey as a pre-workout. They're like, oh, you are a crazy <laughs> person. Yeah. Or, or black coffee. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is your favorite vacation spot? Ooh. So this this is a good question. So there's a secret island that I go to all the time. I'm actually flying in tomorrow morning. It's nice. uh, San Andreas off the coast of Nicaragua. So it's it's a Colombian island, mm-hmm. but it's not really close to Colombia. So it's about an hour away from uh, Cartagena. Yeah. So I usually go there. It's super, super cheap. Uh, and it's like a world wonder. It's so beautiful. You get island hop. Uh, it's so affordable. And so uh, Colombians usually go there for vacation. So I go there and and just relax and have live my best life. I speak Spanish. I blend in. Uh, nice. You know, it, it's great. <sighs> I need to take my Spanish lessons. I need to start. I need to, I need to take a damn vacation. I'll tell you that much. Yes. Um, we talked about color a little bit earlier. Yeah. What is? And and I know it's going to be a challenging one, but. What is the that most commonly used color that you're using at this moment? Like if someone were to look at like your clothes and it's like, all right, I see a lot of that color on your thing. Um, and for that color, what does it represent? What are the thoughts around that color? Oh, this is good. <clears throat> so it's it's pink or uh, magenta. OK, so and, and, and it doesn't always always necessarily mesh with with the color palette that I'm working with, but I always try to sneak it in. And so it's been my favorite color for about two years now. Mm-hmm. And I've been studying color theory and pink, what it symbolizes under color theory is uh, the need uh, to help. Uh, you think about uh, breast cancer. So breast cancer, yeah. like the bow is pink. So yeah. it's pink of like, this is a, this is a, a mission uh, to help and to serve others and so pink symbolizes that and i try to i try to weave it in like pink dress shirt under my suits or pink tie and just you know i pink roses sometimes and so that's my color uh, and that's what i'm rocking with for right now for the for the next couple of years i think so i like it i'm gonna do some some deep dive into color theory and thank you for sharing that because yeah. i got like two that i'm always wearing and it's like all right what, what messaging am i putting out there it's a lot of burgundy a lot of gray okay like, you're just a villain that's what you're putting yeah. out there actually <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're a movie villain that's ox blood yeah. that's not burgundy yeah. um so this is the last one i got for you um so do you think you could win a game show and if so what would the game show be I, I I believe I, I could win a game show, and I think it would be uh, geography. I was real when I was in prison. I had a ritual of uh, watching Seinfeld every day. I think at like <laughs> seven, and then at seven thirty, Jeopardy came on. Yeah. So Jeopardy, I would play Jeopardy uh, just in the, in the rec room and just yeah. answering questions. But really, really good at uh, geography. Yeah. I'm definitely a Jeopardy guy too. I asked this question to someone yesterday. It was like, which one for you? I was like, Jeopardy. I'm mm, for yeah. nerd. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, I just know random trivia. Um, so with that being said, um, thank you for coming on to this podcast. And I want to invite and encourage you to tell uh, the folks anything that you feel like we missed here. The floor is yours. Share whatever you want to share. 
Thank you. Uh, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, I, I would encourage people to follow my journey uh, through the work that I do uh, through my Instagram page, uh, Chris Wilson's Life. Uh, also through my foundation's website, chriswilsonfoundation.com. Uh, we're doing a lot of important work through uh, prison education, supporting other artists, uh, financial literacy, and helping people, uh, returning citizens, get on their feet. And so I just encourage people to support uh, any way that they can. So there you have it, folks. I want to, again, thank uh, Chris Wilson, social entrepreneur, artist, storyteller, just uh, everything for coming on to the podcast uh, because you're doing everything. Um, And for Rob Lee saying that there is uh, art um, and uh, social change in around Baltimore. You just got to look for it. (laughs) 